That's a pretty good indicator of impending trouble when people's confidence in the following year is so lousy. And it's unusual. And it has seldom been this bad. History will say that the 21st century is unusual, abnormal, aberrant even. The window from 2000 until now has been abnormally high profit margins, abnormally high PEs, abnormally low interest rates, etc. 40 years of lower and lower interest rates push asset prices up, particularly housing, through the mortgage mechanism. How can it not? If you can afford to pay more for your house because the mortgage rates are 3%, sooner or later you pay more for it. And so the competition bids the price up to fill the available affordability. Now the mortgage is a seven, the same will happen in reverse. It doesn't happen overnight. Everyone in the market wants everything to happen yesterday. But with interest rates and mortgages, it can take a long time to percolate through. But right. you can be absolutely certain that it will. If the world were to behave like it has behaved in every other major bubble, that's all it would take. Are we in, in a major words, bubble? Yeah, yeah, of course. If you look at a 10-year smoothed average PE and a, a Schiller PE, you find that uh, there's a pretty decent spike in 1929, a much higher spike than that in 2000, and a slightly lower spike than that now. This is approximately the second highest point, higher than 29. And in each case, they back and fill, and they go back to more average levels. Even if you allow for a moderate increase in the normal Schiller. We know the market doesn't like inflation. Let's find other things that the market likes or doesn't like. And let's explain, on a coincident basis, why the market sells high and low. It turns out the market is a coincident indicator of comfort. What makes the typical portfolio manager feel comfortable? And number one, it inflation. loves low inflation. Yeah. It hates high inflation. It likes 2% stable inflation. It does not like to see it bouncing around. It doesn't like to see it spike in the worst way. And it does not like to see it hanging around for multiple years. That's the most important one. Secondly, it loves high profit margins. What a surprise. Now, way, way down in third place is the stability of growth. The growth rate does not have a positive correlation with PE. The market is nervous about bursts of high growth. It doesn't like plus nine, minus two. GDP it would growth. rather have plus three, plus three, plus right. three than plus nine, minus two, even though oh, it averages high. Certainty. It likes certainty, stability. Yeah. Comfort is the best description. So you look at this model, and it says 1929 should not have been a surprise. It had low inflation, high profit margins, wonderful profit margins, incidentally. And the growth rate was ticking along at a pretty high rate, and it was stable. So heaven. The market called the Great Depression. Everything was bad. It got the Nifty 50 right on the nose. It got the idea in the 70s that you'd be seven times earnings because terrible inflation, persistent terrible inflation, low margins, wild Variation. economic growth. Oh, yeah. So 6.8 times earnings was the trough. And the model called for almost exactly that. So then it makes what you might call a major error for the first time in 2000. It says in 2000, wonderful profit margins, no inflation. You'll have the highest PE that you have ever seen. Not bad directionally. Instead of 21 times in 1929, a new peak of 25 times. And it goes to 35 times. And that was not explained by anything we could see in history or then. It just happened. You could argue that that is the only really crazy psychological event up until then in American history. We got it 18 months later, it's back on trend. We got the setback, we got the housing bubble right, we got the wipeout right, and then it brings us to the second major deviation. Second major deviation starts in the second half of 21. Second half of 21, we have an inflation spike. Every time we've had an inflation spike in history, PEs have gone down, sometimes rapidly. This one was a strong inflation spike, bloody PEs went up, creating a major gap where the model goes down and the market goes up. And suddenly we've got a big gap. Then the market says, eh, after all, I'm not sure I believe the Fed and the beginning of 22 is the worst six months since 1939. <laughs> but the model is still going down because inflation is hanging around and the model declines. So fast forward, what does it say today? It doesn't like the pattern of stickiness in the inflation. It doesn't like the profit margins, which in real terms have been coming down quite steadily now for over a year. They're down over 15% adjusted for inflation. And the model calls for 16.8, which in the long term is still pretty high. But the actual market is 29. Times earnings. Yes, on a Schiller, smooth basis. And on a Schiller, it's 29. Right. This is a pretty handsome gap. And what this says is, that is if the market responds to the same forces that it responded to 
over an entire 100 year period. It's only been different for a couple of years since inflation spiked. Do we really feel the market is cool about inflation, that it will not get a moment of second thoughts like it had at the beginning of 2022? Maybe this is not yeah. going to be as neat. Just back up a few weeks and we reached this kind of honeymoon period once again, where everyone was confident we were going to have soft landing. Now, 1929, 2000, 1974, the Nifty 50, every one of these, we were going to have a soft landing. Trust me, check the data. Everything was going to work out <laughs> fine. It never does. If you want to look at the great bubbles and nothing but the great bubbles, what you find is the most interesting distinction is one that is unique to them and nothing else. It never happens any other time. And that is the leadership of the market going up, you know, 70, 80% in a year starts to go down as the blue chips continue up. Now, the ones going down have a beta of 1.5. They're meant to go up 50% more than the market. They can't even get the sign right. So in 1929, the S&P was kind enough to have a low priced index, which was pure junk. Pure junk had been up 80% plus in 1928 and is dropping all the way through 1929. The day before the crash, it's down almost 40% before the crash. It is the great, I like to say, primal scream from the stock market ever up until then. Nothing like that happens again until 1972. In 1972, the S&P is up 17. The average big board stock is down 17. That's not bad. Then nothing like that happens again until 2000. In 2000, we know what happened. They take out the growth stocks and they go down basically 50% before rallying. And the rest of the S&P goes up. Yeah. So in September, the S&P is the same as it was at the peak in March of 2000. Right. In the meantime, the growth stocks have gone down Nasdaq 50%. Nasdaq has gone down huge. So right. the rest of the S&P, X, the super growth stocks, has gone up about, we calculate, 13, 14, 15%. Same thing has happened. High beta stocks have gone down, blue chips continue up. And it happened this time too, only the fourth time in history where going back to 2021, starting with QuantumScape and quickly going through Kathy Wood's portfolio and on through the meme stocks and everything. There is an ugly year following my waiting for the last time. Because lasted right through the end of December. But that is exactly what it did in the other three bubbles. In other words, if you're predicting a bubble you should be saying, and the characteristic of this decline will be this unique, odd event where the super leaders with the highest betas go down as the last gasp of the blue chips. And okay. then the bubble will break. I think the temptation to manipulate these major variables is overwhelming, uh, particularly done in the interests of saying the market can go up a lot. I have a, a long history of dealing with this tendency over a few decades, and I get it. It's nice to be optimistic. And given half a chance, the investment business, of course, has a commercial imperative. It absolutely has to be bullish. It doesn't make any sense to be anything else. It maximizes the return over the full cycle, and that's how they do it every time they're bullish. So right. you never expect a major investment house to be bearish. They are risk factors. Price to book is the market's definition of who's got the most suspicious assets in the business. And small cap are more likely to go out of business, of course, than large cap. So when you buy them, you take on some risk and you expect a higher return. Quality, on the other hand, they have less debt. They are less vulnerable to a financial crisis. They are solid enterprises with long histories. They are less vulnerable to an economic problem. A AAA bond, everyone knows and expects it will yield one point less than, say, a B, right? That's the law of nature. You take less risk, right. they go bankrupt less. The AAA stock, however, has a long history of returning half a percent more than the market. It's ridiculous. It's the only free good. It completely clashes with the early versions of the efficient market hypothesis. It says, by taking less risk of all kinds, less volatility, less any kind of risk, less beta, less bankruptcy risk, you still get an extra half point a year, whether it's 100 years. Last 10 years has been a little bit better than that. Last year has been considerably better than that. So it is very much a candidate for the only free lunch in the investment business. High, stable return with low debt. If you meet that category, good would be high sheet. quality. And, and a good balance sheet. The fangs have very high average quality because they are, let's face it, monopolies. And they have great pricing control, obviously. And they have good profit margins. They aren't necessarily higher quality than Coca-Cola, but combined with growth, they're pretty damn high quality. If you add that up, what it shows is that from 2010 until today, the US market in total goes up 70% better earnings than the rest of the developed world. It has never done that in history, and it probably will never do it again. 
but for 10 or 12 years, it had this amazing 70% excess performance. If you take out the fangs, the rest of the American market did better, maybe by 10% or 15%, but that's the margin by which they've done it a few times in history. It was the Magnificent Seven or whatever we want to call them that turned that 15% outperformance into 70. I mean, Jesus, 70 is a big number for a 10 or 12 year outperformance of the rest of the world. These right. guys Do have some of the most magnificent leadership in the history of capitalism. Plus, they had an almost infinitely favorable environment, such as no monopolies. They're all monopolies that were allowed to monopolize. And they did it very, very well. These guys, mm. your Magnificent Seven, they're all dealing with brand new ideas that had never been tried before. Nothing like Google, ever. Completely transforming, revolutionizing, really, the acquisition of data in a hurry. Actually, you'll find that the Procter & Gamble's and the Colgate's of the world and Coca-Cola's, yeah. they have been aggressively, you know, finding the smallest African country will have Coca-Cola and Colgate yeah. toothpaste if you look hard enough. And Apple, it was even pretty capital intensive. It's a kind of metal basher, isn't it? On which they had to superimpose style and luxury and functionality. They just had to be one step ahead of the competition in the combination of style and functionality. This is really desperately difficult and incredibly unusual. Maybe the world will turn against them and the mean reversion will be a slow burning, semi-political kind where a few countries will say, it is not to our long-term advantage to have this degree of monopoly over this big a chunk of our economy. I mean, that would be a danger I would worry about if I were them. Basically, I say, I've been here, done that, terminal paralysis, we used to call it. Everything looks ugly. I know how you feel. You feel paralyzed. It's not that you are deciding to do anything. You can't make decisions. And what you have to do is overcome that. You have to get a battle plan together. Even a half-baked one is a lot better than nothing. These are cheap prices. You haven't seen anything this cheap for 22 years. That's yeah. a long time. It will more or less guarantee that you do pretty well for the next seven years on our data. We had double digit on the S&P for yeah. seven years. This was a far cry from two years earlier. So put together a plan and start investing your money however fast you invest it. You can't be too aggressive in those situations because even if the market goes down another 25% in the next month, it doesn't matter. If you've been out of the market, you don't, you don't need the bottom. We're already a hero. How do you maintain your hero ship? It's getting in with a lot. In real life, what happened is that I argued for this time is different. Five most dangerous words. This time is never different. I debated the topic of we are in a bubble in 2016. I took the no, it's not a bubble. And the other side was, yes, it was a bubble. I was not looking. I was into this time is different. The surge that took place in late 2020 finally had the characteristics that had been missing this epic 10 years. The mania came out. As I have said many times, written many times, bubbles, it's not just about price. If you get price and it's boring, that is not a peak. Need Higher prices plus crazy behavior, which is unique that you have never seen anything quite that. And NFTs qualify? Absolutely. Yes. Meme stocks qualify. Sure, absolutely. QuantumScape is the biggest scale of any bubble in history. There was nothing that scale, Visual any individual company. stock. Okay. Japan, yeah. real estate is the mother and father of all bubbles, much bigger than their stock market, which is the mother and father of all stock bubbles. Their real estate was over 10 times downtown Manhattan. And downtown Manhattan was very high priced. Downtown Tokyo was over 10 times. That's the biggest bubble, I think, in history, including the South Sea bubble. The stock market in Japan went to 65 times stated earnings. There was some cross ownership complexity, but it looked like an amazing, amazing bubble. I think everybody else is guilty of the usual crime of expecting a soft landing when it never comes, but it's always claimed, believing the Fed, who has never gotten one of these bubbles right, regardless of now. the fact they have involved several different Feds, underestimating the time that it takes for some of these things to work through, particularly real estate. And I'm sympathetic on that one because real estate is a global bubble. It has driven house prices provably to multiples of family income all over the world. China, you know, Beijing, Shanghai, you tell me, 15 times, 20 times family income, Sydney, Adelaide, etc. Canada, the UK, London, they used to be multiples of three and a half times family income. London is now 10, Toronto's worse, etc., etc. No one can afford to buy a house. No young kids coming out can buy a house. This is not a stable equilibrium. 
Furthermore, the mortgages have gone from three, which explains everything, to seven, which explains nothing. And eventually, the seven will start to explain quite a bit. But how long does it take? I mean, just think. The first reflex is, I can't move, for God's sake. I can't afford to go from three to seven. Sure. So I am going to stay, which means no houses are on the market, which means for the handful of people who have to move, they're actually in a bidding war. Real estate has never been about three month predictions. It works slowly but surely. In the end, you pay more because you could afford to. In the end, you will pay less because you can't afford to. House prices will come down in everywhere. 30 would be a pretty good guess. Now, let me get on to a quick subdivision that everyone has forgotten. In the 70s, 80s, 90s, we always stated everything inflation adjusted. Nobody is stating anything inflation adjusted now. Anything. Let me point out that in the great cycle from 2002 to the housing bubble, emerging outperformed by 180 percentage points. It went up 2.8 times the S&P. These cycles can be huge. And then it's been hammered like everybody else in the world. The way to look at this event is the aberration is non-US equities. Every asset worth talking about has been driven up by 40 years of declining rates, as you should expect, led by housing. But farms and forests, which we have some interest in, they've all gone from yielding 6% to yielding 3%. Fine arts, all gone through the roof. Everything has gone through the roof. The US market, through the roof. But non-US equities are curiously left behind. And I can't tell you why, because I'm not sure I have a reason for it. Every asset should be pushed up by low rates, and they all have been, except can equities I, outside I? the US. In a nutshell, if you short these kind of stocks, you will have a short but exciting career. <laughs> because sooner so or later, one or two of them will go up six times and you are asked for six times the money you put up and you are out of business. That's that will not happen to the Russell 2000. Okay. They These also are. have the highest debt they've ever had in history. Almost no earnings. Most of the time, the Russell 2000 doesn't have earnings. When you push the PE, you'll get a not applicable. I believe oh. you get it today. But the point is, if you add them all up, including the negatives, collectively, they have no earnings most of the time, I think, including today. So they have lousy earnings and the highest debt they've ever had. They are zombies. If we have bad economic times, they will get croaked. If we have a financial crisis, they will get croaked. You don't know how these guys will do. They will go down a lot in the stock market, but the first excuse, some of them will bounce. You cannot go short these kind of stuff. Do not go short, period, if you don't have to. If you have a portfolio like I have, then you have to go short. You pick the safest thing to go short. You never go short individual names. And if you do, you never, ever go short that kind of individual name. This time it's different. It's completely different, <laughs> always different. Let me, first of all, agree that, as I already have agreed, the fangs are unusual, remarkable, and some of the candidates for best managed new enterprises, relatively new enterprises in history. Let me also add that every bull market, people always say, isn't it true that the composition of the S&P has changed? <laughs> yes, it always has. And if you regrade it this way, doesn't it make it cheap? Yes. Every single bull market of my career, that argument has been offered. It is a very tempting, seductive argument. In the end, it's all part of one pie. And do you think it's totally unlikely that you'll come back in 20 years and two or three of the Apple-type companies will have received, for unexpected reasons, some terrible shot in the gut, that some miserable countries, perhaps including the US, have moved against them in some way. Some technology shift has made one or two of them totally redundant almost overnight. It's a not new a likely, way though. of getting data, a new way of shuffling this or that, a new iPhone technology at one quarter the price. Who wouldn't like a wonderful flipping phone for $250? Go back to the nifty 50. For 15 years, there were no casualties. The following 15 years, who would have guessed that Avon, Eastman, Kodak, Polaroid, and a couple of others were taken out and shot? The odds are a couple of these guys will be shot. It's shameful, by the way, that they are allowed to rampage. I think they should have some leeway, but to the extent that they're buying up everything, if they are, that would be a shameful state of affairs. Every category, every category, rich, medium, poor, feel nervous and less well off than they were last year, regardless of the data. And some of the issues that came up were the ending of some of the right. stimulus yeah. programs like no payment of student debt, just ending, one after another. That's a pretty good indicator of impending trouble when people's confidence in the following year is so lousy and it's unusual. Secondly, do you know what the record of the leading indicators is? It's dynamite. The leading indicator is a wonderful indicator and it has seldom been this bad. 
But the great bubbles, and they're the only ones I'm interested in, the four great bubbles, they can take a long time. The bear market in 2000 was a three-year bear market, and that was a gentle recession. No problems. The housing market was cheap. The bond market was cheap. It was as specific and localized as you could get. And we had a three-year bear market, 72% decline in NASDAQ. Amazon went down 92, or rallying like mad. This was pretty painful. You make a mistake, you have a Great Depression. You make a mistake, you have a recovery like the 70s. Since Greenspan, the Federal Reserve has got nothing important right, right. Every time it turns, it gets it wrong. Every opinion it gives about a soft landing is wrong. And their battle plan has been wrong. Their battle plan was push up the market to help the economy. And they pushed up the market, and they pushed it, and they pushed it three different times, and it did help the economy. The trouble is, they always went down. And that comes in with a negative economic effect exactly when you don't need it. And they keep very quiet. They actually brag about the upside help to the economy. So they have it rise through the 90s and collapse in the early 2000s. Then they have it rise to the housing bubble and collapse with the housing bubble. And the financial world is brought to the edge of destruction. It really was on its knees. And then they push it up. And here we are once again, same high prices, about the same as 2000 and far higher than anything else.